All right, well, I'll start over here with Brother Joe. Rose, you take John 1 4. Sam, Mark, Scott, Kay, Jim, George, George, Jim, Kay, Joe. All right. Before we begin, I want to ask you a question. You know, sometimes uh, just telling you the uh, sermon Sunday morning, uh, you, you, if I ask you what I preached on, you're going to probably say, well, you preached on lying. No, I didn't. I preached on truth. Truth. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Listen, without truth indwelling you, you're, you're in deep trouble. You're going to miss heaven by a long ways. And so you find out what is truth. Now, that's a simple question. You think you know what truth is? Truth is everything that God is. Everything that God is, that's what truth is. When people try to figure out, say, well, it's just not telling a lie. Oh, no. No, no, no. Truth is everything that God is. His ways, His if you get right down to the bottom line and somebody had to, had to give you this in a moment's notice, here's what I would say. God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's a truth. He's not a deceiver. Lying is deceitfulness. So understand that truth is the fact that God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll always be there. And when he talks about, and a lot of people think you might can lose your salvation here again, I want to explain. John chapter 14, uh, Jesus makes it very plain. He says, he said, uh, you know, if you believe in me, believe also uh, in, in who I am. I'm, I'm God. That's who I am. And he said, and, and those that love me, will keep my commandments. Now listen to what he says after that. He says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you a comforter that will never leave you nor forsake you. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. So understand, so he says he'll abide with you forever. That's his very words. He'll abide with you forever. So I don't understand why people have to argue about this particular thing, but it's one of the difficulties that I believe is always Satan kind. Now I'm going to ask another question before we begin. Can anybody here tell me what the new birth is? You see, you've heard it, you know you received it, but what does it mean? What is, what is it? See, these are, these are things that I'm trying to tell you that when I said this before, I say it again. The reason I'm doing this is I said, we need to start all over. We need to start in kindergarten. The things that we think we know and we just don't know them. So what is the new birth? Well, let me give you what the new birth is. It's Jesus Christ formed in you. If people can't see Jesus in you and, and, and you can't see the presence of, of God in your life, I want you to listen carefully. Your life should be Christ-like. And if it is not, you need to check your salvation or get on your knees and repent because that's what the new birth is. And so we began, and I'm going to keep doing this, little bitty nuggets that we just assume that we know, but when you ask the question bluntly, you can't answer. And that's why. It's because we need to get back to the facts of what our Christian walk is. And that's what it is. Today, we're talking about becoming more Christ-like. That's why I brought that up. I wanted you to see what it means. Christ formed in you. And you have to see that in your life that you're living. If you don't see it yourself, how do you expect others to see it? So I'm telling you that it's the way it should be. So we're going to begin here. 
And uh, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give Sam eliminate falsehood. You got verse 25, Ephesians 4:25, Sam. Uh, Assassinate anger. Uh, Joe, verses 26 and 27. Terminate theft. Verse 28, Rose. Decontaminate your speech. Okay. Sam, annihilate sinful attitudes and actions. That's verses 30. Did I give you one already? Okay, Scott. Verses 30 and 32. All right. These are important facts of what we have to live by and what we need to live by. So if you have your Bibles now, I just want to let you know, I know you assign scripture, but look at in 20, verses 25 through 32, that's what this is uh, associated with, becoming more Christ-like. So when we become Christians, we believe Christ not only as Savior, but as Lord. Do you know the problem we have a lot of times in the way that things are preached is they... I, I want to be saved. We got, Melissa, we got the horse back here and the cart up there going down the road. Now, you know that's out of place, don't you? I'm telling you right here and now how many type of people say, I want to be saved. How can I be saved? Well, first and foremost, one of the greatest questions should be, are you willing to give up your life and let someone else be Lord of your life? Someone you can trust, someone that's died for your sins. Because if you don't do that and repent and him be Lord, he's not your Savior. He's not Savior and then becomes Lord. He is Lord. And if he becomes your Lord, he is your Savior. And that means, again, Christ being formed in you, and that's what he's speaking about. Now, as we let Christ be the Lord of our lives, our old values, attitudes, and habits are replaced by new ones. As we allow Christ to take control of our lives, we change and become more and more like him. Becoming more Christ-like requires us to do five things. First, eliminate falsehood in Ephesians 4.25. You know, Paul was not content to explain a principle and then leave it. He applied it to different areas of life that needed to fill his power. Paul, Paul even named the sins. He said there's five different sins uh, in this section that he, he knows that Paul told us to avoid. And they're important points that are given, especially here. So he explained why. Lying was first. A lie is a statement that is contrary to the fact. Spoken to deceive. Now when you sinful, when your sinful nature was put off in the crucifixion of Christ, the lying tongue and the deceitful heart was also crucified at the cross, on the cross. Understand that we have to uh, abide and, and, and be careful uh, when we look at these things and that's why I said when, when you think that, uh, well I, can, I, I know that this is going to help this person if I lie for them how, how many times, you know, uh, <clears throat> I've even, now get this, I'm telling you what's the truth. I've had people ask me, so preacher said, if they tell you this, don't tell them, tell them I did this. And I said, are you kidding? You're wanting me to lie? I just want you to just, it's not really a lie. Well, what is it? And I'm talking about church members, friends. I'm telling you the truth. I, I've had people even in my family say, you know, if they, if they ask about this, tell them you don't know nothing about it. I said, if they ask about it, they're going to get the whole scenario. Jenny came to me and she had been on the phone and she came to me and she said, now honey, I'm going to tell you something, but you're not allowed to tell anybody. And I said, well, that's fine. I said, but if somebody asks me, what am I supposed to do? 
She said, oh, forget it. I ain't telling you. I said, good. <laughs> because she knows that I'm not going to tell her why. I mean, I'm going to put that person before I put God. So how many times has every single one of you, I don't care who you are, every single one of you have been put in that predicament? And, and that is nothing but deceitfulness. And that's what Paul's talking about here. And, and uh, I, I couldn't help but uh, to see what I had mentioned Sunday. And uh, a lot of people got a kick out of this. So it's, he's written it in here and I used it in my sermon. One day a pastor spotted a group of boys gathered around an irresistibly cute puppy in the church parking lot. They were making quite a commotion. So the pastor walked over and asked, well, boys, what's going on? We found this puppy, said one of the boys, and all of us want to keep it. So we're having a contest. The one who can tell the biggest lie wins the puppy. Shame on you, said the pastor. I can't believe you would do such a thing. Well, when I was your age, I never told a lie. The boys fidgeted and looked at each other nervously. Finally, one said, okay, pastor, you win the dog. <laughs> Amen. I think this story is a great lead in what command of Ephesians 4.25. Wherefore, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. You know, when we speak the truth, the Spirit of God goes to work in our bodies, in our hearts, in our minds. Now you wonder sometimes, how am I going to get away from this temptation? Well, start by talking and telling the truth. You see, the truth becomes a strength. A strength that temptation don't want to deal with. Because temptation is basically a deceitfulness such as a lie. When you tell a lie and you have to realize it, Satan really goes to work. And he's not going to give up that ground. When you tell the truth, God's Holy Spirit goes to work in you. And those are important things to know. So, but such is not the case. We, we may uh, we might not see the consequences immediately uh, when we tell a lie, but they will come. John 1, 20, uh, 1, 1 John 2, 21 says, You know that no lie is of the truth. Now, Revelation 22, 15 says, Hell is prepared for whosoever liveth and maketh a lie. Now, I want to stop right there, and I want to get something in your hearts and minds. Jesus said all people, all men are liars. Does that mean everybody goes to hell? Now, I said that again Sunday. That means very plainly those who practice such things. Now, let me make sure you understand something. If I let you assume something is, is a way without me saying it or trying to do it, but I've made you assume that something's a particular way, that's just a lie without saying it. My actions are going to make, an, make you assume that something has taken place. Now, what would be a good, uh, good example of that? Well, you know, I, I would say like this. I would say, you know, I, I'm coming to church Sunday and uh, I hope and pray, you know, everything goes well for me and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try so I, I'll meet you there. And so it comes along and Sunday's there and next thing you know I didn't come and, and you say <coughs> well why didn't you come well I didn't know it but uh, now listen I'm lying okay I didn't know it but I had already promised somebody something and that's why I didn't come well, the truth of the matter was they already knew they wasn't going to come. They already knew they had other obligations. And so they let that person assume that they're coming to church. All they've done is told a lie and then told another lie with it. Assumptions are nothing but a lie in deceitfulness. That's something you better be careful of. Because if you practice such things, you're practicing lying. That's what I want you to see. And practicing lying has a place in the lake of fire. So that's something that we need to be very careful of. This does not mean that anybody who ever told a lie is going to hell, but those who practice it will. Become more Christ-like requires making the world of lying and dishonesty and entering the realm of truth. Referring to Jesus, John writes, He has seen the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Then what does he write about John 1.14? And the Lord, the Lord was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. 
You know, before faith could bring about the new birth, it had to have an object on which to rest, and that rest was on Christ. The light John speak of is moral and spiritual rather than something visual, full of grace and truth. God revealed himself in human form. In other words, again, I want you to see, faith has to have somewhere to hang itself. Now let me get, get you in the understanding of faith. You think that uh, you you uh, you have faith and you you uh, because you believe. I want to tell you a little something. Our Almighty God the Father put faith in every human being that breathes. Now to develop that faith or disregard that faith is a decision you make. See that faith needs to grow. Now how do I grow my faith? <coughs> In several Bible lessons way back there, I told you how. The more you know about Jesus, the stronger your faith will become. Now listen why. The more I know about George, the more I know about Scott, or I know about Sam, or, or Kay, or Joe, or Mark, any of you, if, if, if I know, the more I know about you, the more I know how you're going to be in my life. Now, did you hear what I say? Every single thing. Now, let me show you something. All of you. Scott, Scott's dealing with a teenager. What do you know about her? Well, he, he knows that he sees a lot of changes and those things, the more he knows, the more he knows how to handle it. Well, it's in the same thing with Christ. Your faith will grow, and as, as it grows, he grows as a parent. So will you as a child of God. The more you know about Jesus, the stronger and the more your faith will grow. See, a lot of people, they're not going to read the Bible. They're not going to care uh, what Jesus said. They'll, they'll fiddle or do something. And the sermon's over with. They don't know no more than when they first came in. They take nothing out of the sanctuary. And when they do that, they've missed opportunity to grow in their faith. It's theirs to do it with. I can't grow your faith. Only you can do that by knowing as much about Jesus as possible. Everybody understand that? Say amen. amen. See, when you're in Sunday school and, 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 and you're listening to the teacher and the teacher is teaching, uh, you've got to realize that, that's your faith that's growing. And, and you need that good teacher. It's not some off-the-wall story. It's, it's the Word of God. And by the Word of God, the more and closer you know Christ. Well, what would he do? Well, he, he mentioned here many things we talked about. And so please understand that it's something very, very very, very important. So to become more like Christ, we must be full of truth. Leave no room for dishonesty or lies. We must let the truth because tell the truth because we are members one of another. If we do not speak the truth, we cannot bear each other's burdens, eat, teach each other, or encourage one another. Listen, uh, one of the things I think it really hit home uh, for Jenny this week when she was talking about how I'm just burdened. I'm just let, you know when you have family problems and things that's come her way with the children or something. You know, she says, you know, I, I, I'm just so burdened. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it. I said, well, won't you just stop and let's sit down here a minute. I said, Jesus says, bring me your burdens. Now, if you can't trust him with them, don't bring them. But if you bring them to him, bring them to him in prayer. Lord, this is what's troubling me. You already know, and you, you just lay it all out. God, what can I do? What kind of prayer can I speak that would help these people? What kind of things could I do that would benefit them to come, that their burdens would be lifted, that they would come to be closer to you? These are important factors. This is how you come to the Lord. You're not to carry those burdens. They will weigh you down, and next thing you know, you're going to see a lot of trouble. 
So if we all speak the truth, we cannot bear each other's burdens. Someone said, I don't lie, I just don't tell the whole truth. Someone else said correctly, half a truth is a whole lie. Some people say I only tell white lies. But if I tell white lies, we will eventually become colorblind. To become more Christ-like, eliminate falsehood and assassinate anger. Uh, verses 26 and 27. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Anger is an emotional uh, arousal that's caused by something that displeases you. In other words, it didn't go your way. Anger in and of itself is not a sin. Does that shock you? Jesus was angry and sinned not. God was angry and sinned not. We should be angered at sin, but not the sinner. The believer is commanded to be angry in certain conditions. Jesus was, was angry at how the temple was used like a harlot, buying and selling, but smoldering with anger, uh, uh, with malice. And so understand that when he sees something of the, of the God the Father's uh, that's being misused, yeah, he, he was very angry. Well, let me ask you a question. Your earthly father... Uh, you know, you have the relationship that, that Jesus has with his father, our father. And, and somebody misuses your father's things, it's got to anger you. Now, whether you act on it or not, I don't know. But you must realize sometimes you need to, you need to respect your father. When you, when you do not get angry at someone's misuse of speaking ill will of your father or things of him and you don't get angry about that you you got to realize that well I put you if I do that I, I would sin well you might it might lead you to sin but the anger is to be at what is said not the person that's doing it you say, how do I do that? Well, that's why we call it faith, and that's what we call coming to church to learn. How do I do that? Well, you do it very simply. One is correctness. The other is prayer. Now, what did I just tell you? Be angry at what they said and pray for the very one that said it. Everybody got that? That's how you separate. That's what you do. Now, as Christians, we are commanded, be ye angry and sin not. There are some things that should make us angry. Rape, domestic violence, child abuse, injustice should make us angry. We should be angry at these sins, but we should always love the sinner. Also, we should become angry about things that dishonor God or pervert his word. Jesus became angry at the money changers in the temple because they were defrauding the people who were exchanging their foreign money and getting only a fraction of its worth. As a result, according to John 2.15, what does Jesus do? And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the and the ship and the oxen and poured out the chamber of money and overthrew the papers. You know, sometimes we might miss everything that was done. The anger that was there was the defrauding and such. <clears throat> but notice, notice why did Jesus uh, allow the animals to be set free? Why did, why did he make sure that they were gone? Well, you have to come back and realize here's the Lamb of God. Sacrifice is no longer needed to be done in the temple because the Son of God was going to be the, the sacrifice, and it was, it was very close at hand. And so we can see that in there too, when the temple and its sacrifices would be gone and the final sacrifice would be Christ Jesus. Now good anger is sometimes called righteous indignation. Jesus was angered when he saw worshipers being defrauded in the temple. Of all the sinful actions recorded in the gospel, nothing angered Jesus like what the money changers were doing. Prosperity. Now here we go. We got prosperity gospel. 
all over the television, the internets, and listen. You'd say, well, who's stupid enough? Well, it must be a lot because they, they're, these people are worth millions upon millions upon millions of dollars. Flying in big jets, private jets, mansions, horses, name anything they want, they've got it. And they, you know what? And they still don't have enough. They still keep trying to get more. Isn't that something? Boy, I don't want to be one of them to stand before the Lord. Prosperity preachers today are doing the same thing. I've heard TV preachers ask their viewers to send them seed money. Promising if they do, God will miraculously send them many times that amount. <clears throat> That's just another form of money changing that angers the Lord. You know, this past week I had some folks that uh, was very sad that... Uh, got lung cancer it don't look good and I'm sure they had talked to their parent their pastor but uh, they wanted to talk and and I told them what I think they should do and and some scripture that they should be reading every single day and to see where it goes but the decision is God's the decision is God's. I don't have a, no miracle in me. Uh, I'm a miracle that I'm here. And I'm just going to say it again. You must trust the Word of God. There's no power greater on earth than the Word of God. The Word of God is power. Now, sometimes healing comes through death. But you must realize death does not have a stain. The Word of God has taken it out. Now, who's the Word of God? Jesus is. He, he died for that. He, he conquered hell, death, and the grave. The Word became flesh and went to that cross and died for you and me. So that Word is powerful. Also, God inspires Paul to write, Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Don't misinterpret that verse like <coughs> Phyllis Diller, who paraphrased it, Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. Stay up and fight. You know, people who use that and... Uh, when they, when they disassociate and mock God, uh, be careful. We all have sinful anger at times. However, sinful anger is dangerous. What warning does Proverbs 29, 22 give about that? An angry person starts fighting. You know, the proud mind of a rebel against the very thought of the sovereignty of God is what it is. Divine sovereignty does not destroy the human responsibility. I understand that. Listen at it again. Divine sovereignty does not destroy human responsibility. When God gives you a responsibility, you are to accept it and be responsive to what you need to do. Response to what you should do. That's why it says responsibility. He who owns anger is a man of wrath. Depart from him. Now listen, I'll tell you something. Here's a little thing you need to put down. <clears throat> okay, you quick with this. Look up Proverbs 23, 23. <clears throat> this is something I hope that every single one of you will put in your hearts and minds and put it in your scripture. You know, you can put it in a little paper and put it on the refrigerator. But this is a fact. Proverbs 23, 23. Put it and fix it and put it on the, on the refrigerator uh, or as you look at it. Now, what does it say? Buy the truth and do not sell it. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. Buy the truth and don't sell it. Man, that's, that's powerful. That's powerful. You say, hey, how do I sell it? By lying. And do you know every lie is costly? Every lie is costly. <clears throat> Sinful anger shows up first in a sharp tongue. But as someone has said, the quickest way to cut your own throat is with a sharp tongue. Even righteous indignation can sour and become sinful. So we should get over our anger by the end of the day. If we don't control our anger, we will give place to the devil. This means we will give the devil opportunity to lead us into sin. Prolonged anger leads to the sins of resentment, bitterness, and hatred. <clears throat> Let me also add to this. It will cause your health to fail. 
Preacher, is that what's wrong with you? No, but I'm telling you that it can solid have a difficulty on your health. I'm telling you. Laughter is good for, for the soul. And you've got to see here, bitterness in the, in the body is not meant to be there. It will, uh, I'm going to give you point blank. Anybody, I've uh, told you before how old David was when he died. And I'm going to say to you, he carried a lie around for a solid year. It, it cost him in his health. And I mean it, it cost him in his health. Do you know how old he was when he died? He was 70 years old. David was 70 years old. And I mean, you'd think, well, I figured David would live probably into the 80s. What? 70 years old. That's what he was. He carried, he carried his sin around for a whole year lying and trying to hide it. You see, it took its toll on him. <coughs> Excuse me. Up down to bottom. Becoming more Christ-like requires eliminate falsehood, assassinate anger, and terminate theft. Verse 28, Rose. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that he you know, this the slaves back in uh, was particularly uh, they 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 stole a lot. They had a lot of sin. The, they didn't have anything in Paul's day, so usually they were not cared for, and they they had a need. And and I, it sounded like, well, preach you make an excuse for their stealing? Absolutely not. And the law, laws uh, gave them no protection. But not only the slaves, but citizens in general were addicted to stealing. <clears throat> Just as Satan. Uh, is a murderer and a liar is also a thief. <clears throat> In John, again, John chapter 14, when, uh, no, it's not John 14, it's one of the other, other things, I think it's in Proverbs, uh, no, Psalm 91. Uh, that he speaks about, now I want you to listen very carefully. In Psalm 91, it says in there that he's giving you power to uh, trample the lion and trample the cobra. Now, what does that mean? Well, you'll hear people say, well, that means I can pick up a snake and it won't bite me. But... I want you to understand again, this is principalities that understood. The lion represents, who goes around like a roaring lion? Devil. In other words, he's saying, beware because here comes Satan. He comes in power to overcome you. Then he may come as a slithering snake to deceive you. Everything has to do with Satan. That's the power that is in you to overcome the power. And when we begin to, to, to speak in our scriptures, we talk about before we put it on our whole armor of God is what is it we say? We say, you know, uh, finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may not be able to stand against the evil as the wiles of the devil. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So in other words, what he's telling us and making it very plain is we have the power if we armor up, and what are they? He says, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of gospel peace. Every one of these has great meaning. Meaning. But now let's go over here. God gave you faith, and if you've developed it, and he said, but above all, take the shield of faith. When you believe God will take care of it, Satan's darts that's coming your way can't touch it. So that's where the power, the power that you use that God has given you is your faith, the shield of faith. <coughs> so understand these are important points that we need to understand. You, you may say, I'm not a thief. You might want to wait to say that. Paul writes, let him that stole steal no more. <clears throat> There's a tremendous misconception today. <clears throat> Excuse 
excuse me, even among Christians about what it means to steal. For example, there is tax theft, which includes omission of hidden income and dishonest tax deduction. A man sent the IRS a check and a note that read, a while back I failed to report some income to you and I'm having trouble sleeping. Here's a check for $500. If I can't sleep, I'll send the rest. However, we must remember what command of our Lord in Matthew 22, 21. Do you know why Jesus was saying that? They were walking on Roman roads. Uh, they didn't mind doing that. And, and you know, sometimes we, uh, we want, I'm not trying to tell you, I, I sort of kidded Charlie. I called him on the phone and I said, Charlie, I just called and check on you, see if you're coming over this way tonight. And he said, no preacher, I got to get, so I'm behind on my, on my offerings. I said, no, you're behind on your dues. You're going to have to get them caught up. You're going to get kicked out of Ridgeview Baptist Country Club. And he did cackle. But anyway, what it is, is, and it's speaking about here, Jesus is saying whatever belongs to Caesar. You're walking on his roads. You're, uh, you've got this doing. And, and a matter of fact, they, you might not like it, but they're keeping peace. There's no wars going around. You don't have to worry about that. And so Jesus says, render unto Caesar. The coin had Caesar's picture on it. Give to Caesar what's Caesar's, but give to the Lord what's the Lord's. So what is he saying there? Well, render unto God the things that are God's. You know, the hardest thing in the world is for people to tithe. They, they don't realize that. They say, well, I would go down there, but that preacher wants my money. Oh, man, I do. I need a new set of golf club. Silliness. Let's look at something straight. It's God's. Now, what did I tell you that the Jewish people were doing? They were walking on what? Roman roads. Look at this. What am I doing? Who, who's oxygen am I breathing? Well, I don't guess we value that much. Understand, render to Caesar what's his and to God what's his. We don't do that. We just don't do that. There's also a debt theft. Business loses billions of dollars each year, and some small businesses even go under because customers won't pay their debts. As Christians, we must remember what truth in Psalm 37, 21. The wicked borrows does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that one of the things I'll never, never forget, and I think of it time to time, is Jim Hope and Jim Harris and Jim King and Leroy. Now, all these Jims were in there and one Leroy. We were playing golf over at Kramer Mountain. We was coming up number nine, and, uh, and I seen this uh, sign up on there, and I said, wow, look at that house. And Jim said, do you know whose house that is, preacher? And I said, no. So he owns the paper doll. I said, the house of sin. So every time I come up number nine, when I play over there, I said, boys, right there is the house of sin. Sin paid for that house. But now let me tell you something. It will go down. Why? Because I, I put in here, the wicked succeed for a time, but eventually they will have to borrow in order to survive. It's coming. While the godly have what they need and can lend to others to be charitable, the wicked will have to borrow. You know why? Well, I'll tell you why. Let's have a poker game. Let's play the lottery. Let's invest in this. Everything that they're investing in is of the devil. It is nothing, nothing. A lady that I know won a ton of money in the, in the lottery. That money, she had a peaceful home. 
But since then, that money is gone. They built swimming pools and everything else, but you know what's in that house now? Tea, totally nothing but fighting, and they don't know what they're going to do now. He's lost his job. She don't have a job. The money's gone. Now what they're going to do, I'm going to go back. The wicked succeed for a time, but eventually they have to borrow in order to survive. I'm telling you, if you play in the lottery and you think, you know what you're saying? <laughs> I've got news for you. If you hit it for a million dollars, you just well stick it in your pocket with a hole in it because it will not, will not, God said it, ill gain will never prosper. And God's word is powerful and true. Now the Bible teaches that uh, not paying that we owe is wickedness because it's just another form of stealing. Instead of stealing, we must labor working with our hands the things which is good. Why does he say labor with our hands? Well, one thing is it's, going to, it's a true way for you to earn money. But do you know what else working with your hand has to say? Working with your hands gives you a, a thought that you're concentrating on and you don't give yourself a lead way for the devil to enter your mind in temptation. Everybody understand that? See, God made us where we can only think of one thing at a time. Now, if you're putting a jigsaw puzzle together, you better be thinking. Okay, you say, preach, help me make work this. I'll give you a pair of scissors, I'll help you. But the truth of the matter, her and Nancy used to put them things together. And I mean, beautiful, beautiful. And listen, they, they weren't small, they were big. And, and, and it takes me back to when I mentioned Sunday morning about me spending time in the mountains. Do you know what? They had the radio and those thousand jigsaw puzzles. <laughs> and so that was your entertainment when... They had, some of them, uh, some of them still burned a lantern and had a radio. You figured that one out <laughs> because the electrical bill was too high. I think it was a dollar and something. Anyway, the Bible teaches not paying is wickedness. Now, while some may acquire money through stealing and deceitful schemes, <clears throat> we must earn our money through honest work and investments. However. If we're selfish, even honest labor and investments can become sinful. Therefore, the Bible tells us the reason we're to work is so we may have to give to him that needeth. This refers only to people in legitimate need. What does 2 Thessalonians 3.10 tell us? For even when we were with you, we commanded you this. <coughs> You know, we're to work while we wait. The Thessalonians had a, a few fanatics who simply withdrew themselves and decided to spend all their time looking for the Lord. They said, look, I, we believe you so much, we're just going to sell our properties and everything. We're just, we're just going to spend our time waiting on God. Paul said, no, 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 no. Well, you said he's coming soon. Well, he is coming soon. A day with the Lord is like a thousand, a thousand years like a day. And so they said, well, you know, and, and he had problems with it. The Thessalonians, they, they, they were good folks and they were, they were uh, contributors and everything, but they had a problem. Paul was saying, if you don't feed them, uh, they'll have to go to work. That's what he was saying. He said, they, they decided they're not going to work. They're just going to wait on God. Well, they'll get hungry. They'll have to go to work. Don't feed them. So they'll return to what they're supposed to be doing. Now that's what it is, and it don't have anything to do with this daily stuff that's going on. As Christians, we are under no obligation to help someone who can work and has opportunity to work but refuses to do so. Becoming more Christ-like requires we eliminate falsehood, assassinate anger, terminate fail, and we're going to stop right there. Is today? 16? Huh? Where's your grain? Where's your grain? It's St. Patrick's Day. Huh? And you know what I say about it, don't you? 
I don't believe in luck, so I'm just forget that green stuff, Joe. You and Scott got on green. <laughs> Sam, what you got? Sam's got on green. What am I gonna do? <laughs> Okay. Scott, I want you to say a prayer. Since you got a sucker in your mouth. Dear Heavenly Father God, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for this time to come together to uh, study your word, worship the Lord. Lord, be with those that have been mentioned in prayer tonight, you know, the hearts of, of everyone here, what we have, and what we have done in this life. Lord, as we leave tonight, let's leave things that do in the house of the Lord and give us safe travels home. Lord, we look forward to our letter. Amen. Now, what is it? What is it? What, what